change. Our speaker is Dr. Wendy Harrison, who is an associate professor of English at Abraham Baldwin Agricultural College. Dr. Harrison got her undergraduate degree from the University of Georgia, her master's in secondary English education from Georgia Southwestern, and a PhD in language and literacy from the University of Georgia. <coughs> she currently teaches classes at ABAC in English and Rural Studies. I found an article about Dr. Harrison on the Rural Study Life page. It says, Dr. Harrison is not a newcomer to rural studies. From a childhood spent in, South, in a small South Georgia town and a college degree in journalism, financed by many hot summers as a peanut scout, <laughs> to newspaper jobs covering rural affairs and agricultural and agriculture. She's always been a wash in rural as well. <laughs> she still gets excited counting deer on the edges of peanut fields while Jeep riding at dusk and seeing wild turkeys ride up always makes her heart beat faster. She, provides a, over, she presides over a household that includes a husband, two daughters, two dogs, and five cats. <laughs> She's an ABAC academic support counselor. She teaches high school seniors in the ABAC Excel Head Start program, and she seems to be one of those wonderful teachers that make a difference in this world a teacher that students remember forever. So ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Wendy Harris. Thank you for that kind introduction. I was very excited when, uh, when Ann asked me to do this for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is I love to talk about the study class. Um, the other reason is, however, it gives me an opportunity to thank the people in Thomasville who were so kind and so helpful to me in the many years it took me to complete this project. Um, uh, Anne and Ephraim here at the museum uh, were always welcoming and cordial. Poor Ephraim drug those yearbooks out every time I came, uh, never complaining. Um, <coughs> Uh, the people at the Genealogical Museum were always helpful. Uh, I left my computer there one evening, uh, and naturally I was in a panic because everything I had been working on for years was on that computer. And, but before I got home, before I could get home, uh, they had sent me an email saying that they had locked it up for the night, and it would be there when I came back the next day. Um, and then after, after I finally finished my dissertation, um, I approached Nancy at the library about uh, creating a plaque to put in the library to commemorate the uh, many things that the study class had done for Thomas County Libraries. And, you know, I anticipated having the lobby for this, and she immediately said, sure. And she even offered to pay for it. Wow. So, uh, you know, right from the very beginning, um, everyone was wonderful. When I first started this project, my intention was to do a study of groups in the area, uh, including Albany, Tifton, Bainbridge, Valdosta, Americas, and Thomasville. But once I came here and saw the rich record that you guys had, I forgot about all those other things. <laughs> um, and, and that was a great decision. Uh, I, I was, I was, it was a lucky happenstance that I came here first. Uh, so it was a great experience, and, and I do appreciate all the help that you gave me, because I would not have been able to complete this otherwise. So many thanks to, to all the people here. When I started, well, when I, when I, this was my dissertation uh, to get, to get a PhD, and when I was going through the uh, dissertation defense, uh, one of my committee members said, well, what does this matter? You know, why does, why does, this, why does this matter? Why did you do this? And I told him, it was easy to answer that question. He said, I, and I said, because women's history is rarely told. Um, most of the most recorded history is, was written by men and is about men, because they were the ones in authority. 
And the many things that women did were not recorded. So, you know, as I was doing this project, that's what drove me. You know, I wanted to give these remarkable women their due. Uh, I wanted to make one small attempt to record some of the many things that women had done to improve their community. So that's, that's what drove me as I did this. So I'm going to read a little bit, and, and hopefully you know, it won't be too boring. Uh, and I do need to say that you know, when you do a dissertation, you have to, you have to take a theoretical approach. Uh, you can't just write. And so I did write my study from a feminist approach. So you'll hear words like patriarchy and feminism and things like that. Uh, words which would have certainly been unfamiliar to the women in the study class, but um, the words would have been unfamiliar, but not the impulses, I think. Um, so anyway, if, uh, hopefully you'll find the study class as interesting as I did, and I could talk about them for hours. Um, I don't have enough time to tell you all the contributions they made. Um, I hit some of the high points here, and I, I sort of placed the study class in the context of the Women's Study Club movement in the U.S. So, here we go. And I, I quote Tom. You'll hear his words. Uh, at the turn of the 20th century, Thomasville, Georgia, was a typical agricultural community in South Georgia in many ways. At the mercy of the weather and other natural forces, as well as history, with all the attendant conditions and prejudices that term implies. Thomasville was different from her neighbors, however, in some ways, and one of those differences was in the way the citizens reacted after the Civil War. In the 1870s, while the rest of South Georgia was still reeling <coughs> from the Civil War and laboring under the restrictions of Reconstruction, the citizens of Thomasville decided they were going to move forward. At the same time, other areas of the state labored under the bitterness brought about by defeat. Thomasville built itself as a winter haven for wealthy northern industrialists and experienced an atypical period of prosperity during the 1880s and 1890s. They welcomed their former enemies and used the money those visitors brought to make their community and their lives better. According to Tom Hill, Curator Emeritus of the Thomasville Museum of History, we soon found that one Yankee was worth two bales of cotton and twice as easy to pick. <laughs> <laughs> and while many of those tourists left when vacationing in South Florida became attractive and possible, many did not. Maintaining ownership of their homes in town and their estates in the surrounding countryside. The study class, fittingly, was established during this time when the citizens of Thomasville were learning new lessons about setting aside prejudices and seeing possibility. In 1906, Mrs. A.W. Beeler, wife of the minister of the First Baptist Church in Thomasville, gathered a group of women in her home who were interested in organizing a club to study literature, music, art, and current events. The effort was about 20 years behind the rest of the country. For a while, Southern women, as one club historian noted, held themselves aloof from the study club movement. Most Southern women identified with their families rather than their sex, and groups of independent women were slow to evolve. The goals of the study class, as the new constitution stated, were to create and maintain an organized center of thought and activity among its members, and to aid in the advancement of education, philanthropy, literature, and art through the interchange of ideas and a broadening of interest and sympathy. These goals are consistent with those stated by one scholar who described women who join study clubs as increasingly educated and who look to their clubs for food for trained, inquiring minds. <coughs> As was the case with other study clubs, the study class began operations comfortably within the confines of patriarchy. Intellectual self-improvement was a goal that clubs could choose without greatly threatening the status quo. This desire to operate in safe territory is made clear in the last part of
of the study class's stated goals, which said the club was to be non-sectarian and non-political, a goal the club did not always reach. <laughs> this group would meet weekly with time off for holidays from October through May for 57 years until the club's demise in 1963. <clears throat> the decades of the study class's existence would be some of the most turbulent in the nation's history, serving as the setting for events that included World War I, the Great Depression, World War II, and the Civil Rights Movement. Through these events, the study class persisted, with the members faithfully arriving at the club room on Thursday afternoon at 4, often carrying a paper on a book, a current event, or a historical figure, and armed with the zeal to improve themselves and their communities. The practices of the study class were serious from the beginning. The choice by the Thomasville group to be a class instead of a club reflected the gravity with, with which members took their study class duties. As one scholar stated, while a number of clubs called their groups a society, circle, association, or guild, some chose the term class, leaving no doubt about the seriousness of purpose. This gravity of purpose is also reflected in the group's choice of study topics and the manner in which those topics were addressed. Study topics included the following categories, history, art, music, religion, philosophy, politics and current events, education, business and commerce, and geography. The wide range of topics, especially in the early years, likely reflected the level of education of those early members and their hunger for more. In her history of the study class, Plow suggested that her grandmother, a bookish English major in college, and an early member of the study class, used the club as a substitute for graduate school, which her father would not let her pursue. <laughs> Indeed, one scholar argued that study clubs allowed women to acquire an approximation of the formal education that was more available to the other sex. The very topics the Thomasville Club study also represented their efforts to find spaces where patriarchy does not apply and to resist some forms of patriarchal control. In another manifestation of resistance, the women of the study class controlled their own literacy practices writing and reading as they chose, and the text they produced and consumed outlined the terms of their own representation. Through their reading and writing, group members processed new concepts of nationhood, economy, gender, culture, and professionalism, sometimes resisting and sometimes fostering them, but always contributing to their shape. Additionally, the emotional engagement with the text multiplied across many common readers, enhanced the feelings of connection and affection among members as they debated meanings, asked and answered questions, and drew analogies to their own lives. Study class members were expected to be active participants in meetings, a practice with which many members were uncomfortable. As one scholar noted, club members were used to passive roles outside their homes, a position which would not be allowed in the study class. The yearbook for 1921-22 stated that the success of the year's program depended on the sympathetic cooperation of each member. The rigor to which members of the study class were held can be seen in frequent <coughs> exhortations by the club's critics <coughs> An, off, an official whose role was to police the presentation of papers, for those delivering papers to speak louder. According to club minutes from 1928, critic also stated, papers are read in too low a voice to be heard in the back of the hall. President asked critic to call attention of the speaker to the fact that she isn't speaking loud enough. After joining the Georgia Federated Women's Clubs in 1907, in the General Federation of Women's Clubs in 1914, study class members were expected to speak at state and national meetings, something they were sometimes reluctant to do. 
1946, as chair of the State Music Committee, a member of the study class was asked to speak for five minutes at a breakfast meeting. The member stated that making a speech, however short, before such a gathering is entirely out of my line. She added, I found out myself thinking of several perfectly good reasons why I shouldn't be here. She explained, though, that she realized she could not afford to miss such a wonderful occasion, this coming together and talking about the things which concern our state and nation today. Groups like the study class exemplified club women's capacity to combine self-regulation with supportive encouragement. As one member of an early study club in North Carolina made clear, such efforts were an important step in women's movement from the private sphere to the public. As she stated, early efforts to speak in club meetings were a necessary step in the evolution of our club life. They gave us the habit of expressing ourselves on paper. They taught us not to fear the sound of our own voices. Members of the study class clearly, clearly wanted their voices to be recorded. The club's constitution and bylaws defined club policies, such as those regarding membership, dues, attendance, elections, and selection of committees. Yearbooks, which the club began printing in 1908, further formalized and publicized club <coughs> practices describing programs for the entire year. These yearbooks had two functions, to inform members about upcoming meetings, making them aware of their responsibilities regarding each meeting, and also to display their projects and activities to others. Club histories, such as the one compiled by B.L. Watt in 1955, represented efforts by members to create a past for their clubs. In addition, club minutes were recorded faithfully for 57 years. Once members of the study class found their voices, they realized they could use them to better their community. And while they wouldn't have said so, their efforts could be called an early, early manifestation of feminist <coughs> stirrings. While most of the study class's projects would not have made the men of their community <coughs> uneasy, the list of the club's achievements is impressive. One of the group's most significant contributions to the community had to do with the local library, a common area of concern among study clubs nationwide. As one caller, according to one scholar, in 1933, the American Library Association credited women's clubs with responsibility for initiating 75% of the public libraries <coughs> in existence in the United States. The club began its formal association with the library with two representatives of the library board of directors visited the study class. The club minutes from February 2, 1910 had the following to say about the visitors, who stated the librarian had resigned, the library had been closed, and they were some $80 in debt. According to the minutes, desiring to start out again on a sound basis, they wished the study class to take charge of the management. The study class, led by the library committee, selected librarians and assistants, and even initiated the first bookmobile in Thomas County. In 1920, members of the study class began bi-weekly distributions of book bags to rural districts in the county. An old photo shows members unloading books from the rumble seat of a car to distribute to a rural patron waiting under a tree on the side of a dirt road. In 1937, this program was expanded thanks to funding from the Works Project Administration when the first truck traveling library in the state was instituted in Thomas County. The study class was not alone in this achievement. In an effort to bring books to more people, women's clubs invented the traveling library. <coughs> For many years, carefully packed boxes of books crisscrossed the rural parts of many states, all under the supervision of women's clubs. In Thomas County, club members also donated books, pasted covers on books, cleaned up and painted the library, 
and arrange needed repairs to the building's exterior. And while the Board of Directors had financial responsibility for library operations, study class minutes record many teas, entertainments, and other fundraising activities to benefit the libraries of Thomas County. The library even offered members the opportunity to be heard beyond their community. In 1925, the librarian appeared before the study class to report that a library bill authorizing counties to help fund libraries had just died <coughs> in the state legislature and to urge each member to use her influence to get it passed in the next legislature. The records make clear that the library in Thomasville would have likely foundered if not for the intervention and continued support of the study class in terms of books, management, and maintenance. Another successful project for the Thomasville group was the establishment of a room where country women who came to town with their families on Saturday could rest and care for, for their children while their men conducted business. According to Mrs. Watt, the group created a restroom committee. When the study class women saw the need for a restroom for the rural women who came into Thomasville to shop, coming in horse and buggy or wagon. She added, in those days, it was an all day trip. So the women and children were in desperate need of some place where they could go and relax or feed the babies and children. According to Mrs. Watt, the club furnished the restroom with cribs, couch, chairs, tables, and the restroom committee was responsible for the attendant to keep the place clean and see the clean sheets, etc were provided. Local merchants provided most of the money for the restroom. At one point, after repainting and furnishing the room, the study class hosted a reception for local merchants and businessmen, businessmen so they could see what their money had bought. Once, <coughs> when funds ran low, the members decided to hang in the facility a list of the merchants who had contributed to the support of the room. But, as the minutes stated, not the amounts they give. <laughs> the study class maintained the restroom from 1908 to 1929, when, as Mrs. Watts stated, the automobile shortened the time of the trip, and the filling stations offered certain comforts and refreshments in the city maintained the public playground. The study class accomplished much under, under the leadership of the club's civic committee, as did their sisters nationwide, <coughs> members of the study class tackled problems that had to do with the health, beauty, safety, and moral tone of their town. Whereas acting individually, the women of Thomasville might have been reluctant to address such weighty issues. As members of the study class, they were able to enact real change in their community. As one scholar stated, while addressing problems having to do with disease and sanitation or petitioning the city council as an individual might have seemed like the work of a crackpot, <coughs> working as part of a club conferred an air, an air of respectability upon what, uh, what otherwise might have been considered unseemly public or political activity as members engaged in systematic efforts to improve village, town, or city life. As early as 1908, members of the study class addressed public health by noting their concerns and placing them before the Thomasville City Council and the public. Their efforts got results. According to club minutes, the Civic Committee were requested to confer with the City Council as to removal, removal of possible causes for fever now prevailing in the town. As part of the same effort, the club also decided to take their concerns to the citizens of Thomasville by asking the local newspaper to publicize the need to keep the city clean. The members agreed to request the Times Enterprise to publish articles as to weeds, etc., on vacant lots, and especially to agitate the question of having the streets swept Saturday night after the stores were closed. Local merchants objected to, objected to having the streets swept, presumably because of the cost, but the study class did not relent in its efforts regarding this issue. 
Neither did the study class relent on the matter of vacant lots. Again, the group took the issue before the public. There was much discussion about the vacant lots all over the city, minutes of many of which are pronounced unhealthy as well as unsightly for the dwellers in nearby homes and passers-by. Furthermore, it was decided to try and approach the owners of these lots through newspaper articles and otherwise, if possible, to see what could be done to improve upon the vacant lots. The study class called attention to many other unsanitary and dangerous conditions in the town. In 1912, the Civic Committee called attention to the ditch back of Brandon's Grocery. It is half filled with stagnant water and rubbish. And if, and, and if not attended to, it will probably cause sickness in the summer. In 1913, the club prepared a report to the city council asking that organization to designate a community dumping ground for debris at a safe distance from, distance from the city and provide oil or another suitable disinfectant to be poured on the same. At the same meeting in 1913, the club also agreed to ask the city council to require that dangerous and unsightly buildings and chimneys be condemned and ordered torn away, and that bakers be required to wrap bread and other products in fly and dustproof bags before being placed in wagons for delivery. The study class was influential enough in the community and the state by 1910 to be asked, along with other state federation clubs, to be part of an anti-tuberculosis conference in Atlanta. The attendee to the conference later reported that officials from the state of Georgia requested the assistance of women's clubs in the state in implementing plans to address this disease. In 1928, the managing director of the State Tuberculosis Association stressed the need for a tubercular hospital in Thomas County and requested the assistance of the study class in procuring one. In 1931, the health officer for Thomas County spoke to the class, setting forth the need of more hospital rooms for tuberculosis patients. The officer further asked the cooperation of the study class with other civic organizations in securing funds for building a small tubercular hospital in Alto to be used by patients in Sacramento <coughs> County. This same official later asked that representatives from the study class appear before the city council in support of this hospital, a request to which the club agreed. By 1933, the hospital was operational. A member who had visited the, the facility told the class of the splendid modern building Thomas County had erected in Alto for Thomas County TV patients. She described Thomas County as the only one in the state that has our own building. Another accomplishment of the city committee was convincing downtown merchants to close one half day a week and earlier in the evening. As the members saw the long hours which the clerks in the stores had to work for six days a week, they voted to have a committee ask the merchants to close for half a day each week and close earlier each evening. Local merchants agreed to close on Thursday afternoon, eventually shortening their evening working hours to six during the week and seven on Sundays. Stated Mrs. Watt, this proved a boon to all involved. The example set by Thomasville merchants spread to other towns. She added that the afternoon for closing was later moved to Wednesday, but she argued the half day still stands as an effective and timely effort of the study class to better working conditions in Thomasville. Watt called this accomplishment by the Civic Committee one of the most outstanding pieces of work done by the study class. A discussion of the contributions of the study class would not be complete without some mention of women's suffrage, a controversial issue for women's clubs at the local, state, and national level. At the national level, Jane Cunningham Crowley, president of the General Federation of Women's Clubs, supported women's rights to vote, along with some of her members. Other members were vehemently opposed. 
Apparently, some members in groups went back and forth on the issue. In an address to members of the study class in 1911, the president of the Georgia Federated Women's Clubs made her position clear. She stated, women's clubs do not discuss politics, religion, or women's suffrage. In 1916, however, the president of the study class brought a communication before the class asking that our delegates, delegates to the state convention be instructed to vote for women's suffrage. Although members brought the issue up several times, the study class never endorsed women's suffrage, even though the state federation did so at the 1919 convention by a vote of 85 to 40. Regardless of the members' stance beforehand, after their right to vote was made part of the U.S. Constitution, at least some of the women of the study class were apparently ready to exercise that right. In 1925, the chair of the Citizenship Committee called attention to the time for paying poll tax. All citizens paying the poll tax would be qualified to register to vote. The minutes from November 12, 1926 stated, the chairman of the Citizenship Committee Urge those members who are not registered for the city elections to do so this week. The members of the study class were keeping an eye on their elected officials as the minutes from a meeting in 1927 proved. The president of the city, the president of the civic committee, no, excuse me, the president asked the civic committee to read the papers carefully, note what the city council and county commissioners proposed doing and watch for any items that would affect the public welfare and the town at large, and report to the study class so they can take action before affairs go too far. <laughs> this statement suggests that the women of the study class were willing to act almost surreptitiously to monitor the activities of the men in power in order to protect, order to protect what they saw as their domain. The statement also suggests that the women despite their pledge to remain non-political, knew they could take action and prevent affairs from going too far. The statement also reveals that the women didn't think too much of the abilities of the men in power to manage <coughs> county business. <laughs> On December 1, 1927, the chair of the Citizen Citizenship Committee again urged class members to register to vote. This would be the last chance, she stated, that we would have to register. In 1928, a member even went so far as to suggest that ballots be obtained and that members of the club ask for information as to the correct way to vote the ticket desired. In her 1955 history of the study class, Mrs. Watts stated that the Citizenship Committee was an early forerunner of the League of Women Voters, keeping members informed as to political news, local activities, and bringing for discussion timely issues. The study class began in heady times for Thomasville, and for 57 years, the members encouraged and supported each other, <coughs> gathering faithfully on Thursday afternoon. They used their collective voice to influence their community and make it a better place to live while at the same time creating bonds with each other. Mrs. Beeler, the first president of the study class, made the club's potential clear in her resignation letter. She said, I love the women who are members of this class and feel that each one of you is a friend. There is a great power for good in this body of determined women. And my earnest desire is that you accomplish greater things in the future than you have ever done. And I think we can say that they did that. Thank you. Now I'll be glad to try and answer any questions you guys might have. And that's not to say that I can answer everything, because these women were amazing. Uh, and they did other things that, um, you know, that I was unable to mention. Uh, they touched every aspect almost every aspect of life here. Um, any questions? 
Do you know what size group it uh, was? It was a, that's a good question. There were the members, there were, there were usually maybe eight to 12 members because they wanted to meet in people's homes. Well, no, no, they wanted to keep the, initially they met in homes, mm -hmm. but they wanted to keep the numbers small. And they actually, you actually had to be voted. You, know, you had to be asked to join, and the members would vote uh, on whether or not someone could join. Uh, now, I'm not sure if they ever denied anybody membership. I mean, those things weren't recorded in the minute. But, uh, yeah, it was, it was a small group. They actually did several other things, too. Yes. They were partly responsible.